Take your Bible and turn to the Gospel of John, the 12th chapter. We're going to read and study verses 1 through 3. John chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. This is the 40th lesson in a Sunday morning series as we've been walking verse by verse and passage by passage through the Gospel according to the Apostle John. And we've made our way up to this 40th lesson and the 12th chapter. Here we officially enter into the last week of Jesus' life prior to the cross. Now that's a very instructive footnote. John takes 11 chapters of his gospel record to talk about 33 and a half years in the life of the Lord Jesus. Then he takes the remaining 10 chapters to talk basically about the last week. And here in the opening of John chapter 12, we find one of the most memorable experiences and occasions in the earthly life of Jesus. A woman by the name of Mary breaks open an alabaster box of expensive, precious ointment. And she pours it on the feet, say this gospel. And on the head, say the other gospel writers. She pours it on the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, in doing so, she prepared his body for burial. But as we notice John chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, we're going to see that Mary is not the only one that poured worship on the Lord Jesus. In fact, we're going to notice in these first three verses, there are at least four individuals that poured on the Savior what I'm calling extravagant worship. If you're physically able, would you stand to your feet to honor the reading of God's Word? From John 12, verses 1 through 3, I'm... Preaching about extravagant worship, Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving, and Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume." May God bless the reading of his word as we take our seats this morning. Mary's bold act of worship recorded here in John chapter 12 was so profound and extravagant that the other gospel writers tell us that Jesus said that in light of what she had done, everywhere the gospel was preached, this occasion would be marked, this story would be told. With one powerful and poignant act of worship, Mary of Bethany finds herself inextricably connected with Jesus of Nazareth. With one act of worship, she is enshrined on the pages of Scripture, and the sister of Lazarus becomes connected with the Son of the living God. The other gospel writers tell us that when Mary came in, she not only poured this ointment on the feet of the Master, she poured it on his head as well. But it becomes obvious in this text that Mary not only touched his head and his feet, Mary touched his heart with extravagant worship. The thing I want you to notice about this text is that it is all about glorifying Jesus Christ. John tells us back in the theme verse, chapter 20 and verse 31, that he has recorded this little story, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you may have life in his name. Now hang on to that verse of Scripture. We'll come back to it at the end, and I want you to see that this little story pictures that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And there's something about this worship encounter that would invite men and women and boys and girls to believe upon his name and find the gift of eternal life. But in order to establish that truth, I want you to notice, Mary of Bethany was the only one that poured perfume on the Lord Jesus, but she's not the only one that poured praise upon the Lord Jesus. In fact, in these three verses, I've identified at least four individuals who give to the Lord Jesus Christ extravagant worship. And I want you to notice them carefully this morning because if you are an obedient child of God, you will fit into one or more of these categories. First of all, we need to consider the place that was prepared. The Bible says that Jesus is making his way toward Jerusalem, toward the cross, And he stops once again in the city of Bethany. And we see that as the people gather to encounter Jesus, to fellowship with him, that a place has to be prepared. 
Now John does not tell us the name of the owner of this house. Matthew and Mark do that, and we'll get to him in just a moment. But I want you to notice, first of all, the motive that ordained it. In other words, why is there even a meal and this fellowship time with the Lord Jesus? I believe the motivation is the same motivation that caused Jesus to raise Lazarus from the dead, to heal the man born blind, to heal the impotent lame man down by the pool of Bethesda, and to perform countless other miracles. I believe the motive that ordained this very meal is the same motive that made Jesus Christ leave the glory of heaven and step down into the sin-cursed world, robe himself in a body of humanity, live in perfection, and die on the cross of Calvary. Jesus is motivated. This meal is motivated by the looming cross of Golgotha. The Bible says in verse 1, Jesus therefore, six days before the Passover... By most calculations, it's the last Saturday before the crucifixion of Jesus. By the end of the week, he will have died on the cross. And by the following weekend, he will have been gloriously raised from the dead. And here John wants us to know, this meal is in the context of something that just happened. Therefore, Jesus went to Bethany. Well, what has just happened? May I remind you that when chapter 11 draws to a close... Jesus, having raised Lazarus from the dead, has simultaneously invoked the wrath and the ire of the Sanhedrin. They conspired together in this little murderous plot to take the life of the Lord Jesus. And Jesus, having learned about that, disappeared to the nearby city of Ephraim. And the people in the city of Jerusalem, the religious leaders in particular, are asking one another, do you think Jesus will make his way to Jerusalem for the Passover? Jesus leaves the cities of Ephraim, 10 to 15 miles away from Jerusalem, depending on the archaeological evidence. Jesus makes his way to the nearby city of Bethany, now two miles away from Jerusalem. I believe that he is sovereignly calling for this celebration, in part, to draw a crowd and to let everyone in the area know he is on his way to Jerusalem. He will indeed make his way to the feast. In fact, the events of this worship service in John 12 are so connected with the cross of Jesus that Matthew and Mark record the words of Jesus saying, This act of anointing has prepared the body of Jesus for burial. You must put this setting, this scene, in the context of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for your sin. Folks, You want a motive that will ordain your worship, see yourself as a doomed and damned sinner on the way to hell, and but for the blood-spattered cross of Jesus Christ, you and I would deserve to spend forever separated from a holy God. But thank God he didn't hide out in Ephraim. He was making his way to the cross of Calvary where he would suffer under the wrath of God for my sin and for yours. There's the motive that ordained it. Notice also the man that owned it. We're talking about this place that had to be prepared for Jesus. There is a similar but distinct event that happened back in Luke chapter 7. There a sinful woman, presumably a prostitute, came in and washed the feet of Jesus with her tears, wiped the feet of Christ with her hair. Luke chapter 7 tells us that that earlier occasion happened, listen carefully, in the home of Simon the Pharisee. But Matthew and Mark tell us that this occasion is happening in the home of Simon the leper. Mark 14, 3, Matthew 26, 6 records that while he, Jesus, was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper, this incident happened. In that other account, Simon the Pharisee had a critical spirit about the worship. And you may remember, he said in his own heart, why if Jesus were really a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this was that was touching his feet and he would have nothing to do with her. That was Simon the Pharisee. But now Simon the leper has no such critical response. Acting just like a Pharisee, the other Simon said that Jesus must not be who he claimed to be. And it led Jesus to teach a great parable about the mercy of God and the blessings of forgiveness. But we find no such criticism from this host, not from Simon the leper. 
Why is that distinction so very important? Why do we need to understand the man that owned this place was Simon the leper? It's because not only of the motive that ordained it and the man that owned it, but the memory that opened it. Simon was a leper. Now, although John does not introduce him in this way, neither do Matthew and Mark, Simon is not merely a leper. Listen carefully. Simon must be an ex-leper. If you understand the laws of Moses, primarily in the book of Leviticus, you would know that if a man was still a leper, still smitten with that terrible disease, still broken out with oozing, running sores all over his body, he would not have been able to fellowship with his own family in his house, let alone invite Jesus and other members of the community to the home of a leprous man. Simon had been a leper. Now, we don't know exactly how his leprosy broke out, but it tended to happen like this. Imagine with me for just a moment that Simon gets up one day to wash his hands, and as he begins to wash his hands, he notices there's a little sore on the top of his hand. He doesn't pay much attention to it, but by the end of the day, it's more than just a little spot. It's more than a rash. It is now open and raw and oozing. By the end of the week, it's not a spot, but many spots running up his arm and across his upper torso. Within just a few more days, he is covered with these oozing, pus-filled sores from head to toe. He notices about this time, there's a deep gash on the bottom of his foot. What bothers him as much as the gash on his foot is that he doesn't know how the cut happened. He knows enough about leprosy to make his own diagnosis. You see, one of the effects of leprosy is that the extremities, the the hands and the feet begin to grow numb. Lepers would injure themselves with with fire and with knives and they they would hurt their own bodies and not even realize that it had happened. With the diagnosis of leprosy being confirmed, Simon became an outcast from his own family. Simon would have become an outcast from his own community. His nerve endings being dead, his body growing numb. Some lepers would even lose limbs off of their body. They would look down and their foot would be gone. Look down and their arm would be gone. Someone would tell them, you're missing an ear. You're missing an eyelid. Your nose has fallen off. Here was a man so outcast from society that if he ever approached anyone or anyone accidentally approached him, the laws of Moses and of ancient Israel required him to yell out, Unclean! 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 That was his way to say, Stay away! Stay away! We don't know if he was married, but if he was married, his marriage was effectively over. We don't know if Simon the leper had any children, but if he did, there were no more goodnight kisses, no more tucking them in, no more hugs, no more embraces, no more meals together with the family. This terrible dreaded disease of leprosy had no treatment, no cure, no remedy. Without a miracle from God, he would literally rot to death. But then one day, A man named Jesus came by and reached out and did something nobody would ever do for a leper. Reached out and I believe touched this man and this man Simon never got over what Jesus had done for him. Can you imagine when the crowd begins to say, Jesus is back in town, we ought to get together. We ought to celebrate what Christ has done and who Christ is. I can imagine Simon the old leper saying, after all he's done for me, you can use my house. I'll make sure that the place is rightly prepared. We're talking about giving extravagant worship to God. This past week I began thinking about all of the Simons that make worship possible here at Emmanuel. I'm talking about preparing a place for the people of God to worship the Lord Jesus. I'm talking about folks who serve as ushers and greeters, making sure the place is prepared. I'm talking about custodians, 
building committee people. I'm talking about folks that put out the offering envelopes and the pens and make sure there's toilet paper in the bathroom. That may not sound like a real big deal until you've been on the pot without toilet paper. People who put out toilet paper, kind of like the sound man. You don't ever think about them until something goes wrong. Hundreds and hundreds of people in this church and churches like ours working to prepare a place for people to come and encounter Jesus. Why do we do that? It's because he's worthy of extravagant worship. It's because like Simon the leper, we were smitten with the leprosy of sin and we just flat hadn't gotten over what Jesus has done for us. The place that was prepared. Notice also the life that was lived. Still in verse 1, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Verse 2 says that Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Now, when I describe worship as being carried out by the life that was lived, usually when a preacher says that, they're talking about a person's lifestyle. The life that you live before an onlooking world. And that's very important. That's vitally important. But but what I'm talking about is the mere fact that Lazarus was alive. His very presence in the worship gathering was an attestation and an expression of the power of Almighty God and the glory of Jesus Christ. Notice three things about this life that was lived. First of all, I'm going to get personal right now. I want you to consider the fact that he attended. The fact that he attended. Go with me in your minds to the city of Bethany. And here's Lazarus. Freshly raised from the dead. And someone comes to him and says, Hey, Jesus is in town. We're gathering over at Simon the ex-leper's house. Lazarus, would you like to come? And imagine if Lazarus had given some of the lame, flimsy excuses that Baptist preachers and Sunday school teachers hear in our day. What band is going to be playing? You know, since I've been raised from the dead, music has become very important to me. I've got my favorite Pandora station. Do you know what exactly is going to be playing on the wireless Bluetooth speakers all around the dining room? Music is so important to me. I need to find that out before I can tell you whether or not I'll be there. Do you know who's going to be given the toast? If Mahala Lil is doing it, I can't. Oh, he's as boring as watching paint dry and grass grow. Mahalalil's toast to Jesus are as dry as cracker juice. But now, if Methuselah is going to be there, son, he can flat toast the paint off the wall. Do you know if Zachariah is going to be there? My sisters told me he always claimed to be my Friend, didn't even have the common decency to show up at my funeral the other day. That old two-faced, double-tongued, backbiting hypocrite. If he's going to be there, I ain't going. Did you, did you say it was this Saturday night? I promised to take the boys over to the chariot races at the Jerusalem Chariot Speedway. I know it's going to be late when we get in. And, and if I'm going to go, I'm going to give God my best. So I'm, I, I don't what, Junior's got to go to a bar mitzvah. You do know this is pre-Passover weekend. Kids are out of school. Now, we're going to try to come, but don't hold dinner on us. To paraphrase the psalmist, I rather think Lazarus might have said, I was glad when they said unto me, somebody's serving a supper for Jesus and I've got a chance to go and let him know how grateful I am for what he's done for me. After Jesus has raised this man from the dead, listen to me, friend, it's only right that Lazarus be there. In fact, I submit that his absence would have been a sinful shame fact that he attended. Notice also the faith that he attested. 
The scriptures never record a single word spoken by Brother Lazarus. As far as we know, Lazarus never even said anything worth writing down. But we do know that there's no record that he ever did anything worth writing down. Now lean in close and listen very, very attentively. The secret to attesting your faith in Jesus Christ is not about what you do and what you say. It's about giving evidence of what Jesus has done for you. In fact, speaking of the issue of corporate worship, the writer of Hebrews said in chapter 10, Let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering. Why? Because he who promised is faithful. Some people, perhaps even in this service, your mere presence is an attestation of faith in Jesus Christ. Whenever Lazarus is introduced in the Bible, he's always given this little title, Lazarus whom Jesus raised from the dead. Now, if you've been raised from the dead, your mere presence is a gift of extravagant worship to God. Some of you, the fact that you're here is an expression of worship to God. There goes that old ex-drunk whom Jesus dried up from the bottle. There goes that former promiscuous woman who Jesus converted her heart and gave her a heart of purity. There goes that man that used to be a deadbeat dad, but look, the very fact that he's in the house of God means there must be something to this glorious gospel. The faith that he attested, the fact that he attended, consider thirdly the folks that he attracted. The Bible tells us down in verse 9, The large crowd of the Jews then learned that he, Jesus, was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. You see, folks, when transformed people, are you listening? When transformed people live transformed lives before an onlooking world, a lot of times folks will come just to see what it's all about. Lazarus had been so radically changed that he was an attractant to Jesus. In fact, before chapter 12 draws to a close, the critics of Jesus, having previously conspired that Christ would have to be put to death, they also reasoned this in their minds. We must make it a double murder. Lazarus is going to have to be put to death as well because as long as Lazarus is alive, people keep coming to Jesus. I wonder, could that ever be said of me? Could it ever be said of you that as long as we are alive, people keep coming to Jesus? I wonder if a memo is in any danger of going out from hell Get rid of that man. As long as he lives, people keep coming to Jesus. Snuff out the life of that woman. As long as she's breathing, people keep coming to Jesus. Do whatever it takes to get them out of teaching that Sunday school class. As long as they're teaching the Word of God, folks keep glorifying Jesus. Lazarus' life attracted folks to Jesus. Now we're going to see in our next lesson, some of them, they weren't really looking for Jesus. They were looking for the show. Drawn by the miracles, the bling, the wow, the signs, the wonders. We still have that happening in our day as well. There are plenty of folks when God begins to move in a church and revival begins to happen, there will be plenty of folks who will come for the show. They don't really want Jesus. They just want the stuff that Jesus can give into their life. Are you listening? But pay very close attention to what I'm about to say. Our greatest danger in the modern church is not, is not that people are flooding the altars and filling the aisles, wanting the manifestations of our transformed life, even though they don't want Jesus. Let me say that again and explain it. Our great danger in the modern church is not that our altar counselors and staff members are having to sort through people that are coming forward trying to figure out, do you really want Jesus or do you just want the radically changed life that this other person has? Do you really want Jesus or do you just want to kick the bottle like that old dried up drunk has done? Do you really want Jesus or or do you just want the, the marriage that has been put back together by Jesus? That's not our great danger in the American church. Our great danger is you can't generally tell a dime's worth of difference between the lives that are lived by the people of God and the people of the world. Not so with Lazarus. 
The life that he lived attracted people to Jesus. So there's the place that was prepared, the life that was lived. And then in verse 2, we read about the meal that was made. You see, once the place is ready and the crowd has been assembled, that crowd needs to be fed. And there's one thing you've got to have if you're going to have a supper gathering. Supper. (laughs) And if you're going to have a supper gathering, there's something else you've got to have, and that's a cook. Preaching on this text more than a century ago, the great Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, It would have been a sad omission had there been no table spread for so blessed a guest. And who could prepare it as well as Martha? I believe that Sister Martha gets a bad rap for her time back in the kitchen. It's because of something that happened back in Luke chapter 10. There was another occasion where Jesus was eating in the home of Mary and Martha. And both of those ladies presumably had been in the kitchen, but during the teaching, during the Bible study, Mary made her way to the feet of Jesus. And before long, here comes Martha. Can you see her with that apron tied around her waist? Maybe there's some flour dusted up on her head. She's got... She's got bread dough up under her fingernails and she comes out and she wants to know, Jesus, don't you care? I'm back in the kitchen with sweat dripping off of my nose. Why don't you tell Mary to get back in the kitchen where she belongs? And if you remember what happened, Jesus said, Martha, Martha. By the way, if your name is Martha, you've probably heard that a time or two in your life. Martha, Martha. Martha, honey, you're worried about so many things. Mary has chosen that thing which is greater, and it will not be taken away from her. But now listen to the preacher this morning. Jesus was not rebuking Martha for her cooking, but for her complaining. Her problem isn't her place. Her problem was her perspective. But now we don't get any hint of that in this text, do we? That's the difference that a resurrection will make. Here's a woman who's willing to work behind the scenes, out of the spotlight, beyond the onlooking eye of the crowd. I was reading this week about Catherine Booth, the wife of William Booth, founder of the Salvation Army. And after she passed away, her son wrote a biography about his mother. And listen to one of the paragraphs he wrote. That in the humble duties of the kitchen table, her hands busy with the food, in the nursery when the children were going to bed, or at the bedside of a sick child, she was working for God's glory. Maybe you've heard about the sign that hung over the kitchen sink of a stay-at-home mother. It simply read, divine services performed here three times a day. And you know, that is true for Martha, and it can be true for each one of us. When our desire is to honor the Lord Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter if you're a contractor, a mechanic, a welder, a banker, a baker. You can be a bus driver, a school teacher. You can be a doctor, a lawyer, or an Indian chief. If your desire is to glorify Christ with your service, your work can be as much an act of worship as was Mary's alabaster box. The meal that was made. I want you to quickly notice three things about it. First, the labor that was required. Martha is one of the great ancestors of all who work behind the scenes and don't care to be noticed or have their name printed in the bulletin. Every cook in the building knows that Martha's work necessarily began long before the party started and the guests began to arrive. The food had to be purchased. The food had to be prepped. The food had to be prepared. And no doubt that began hours before the party even started. In the same way that Martha's meal took a lot of preparation, so too, listen, so too does a worship service. I think of Sunday school teachers who begin on Saturday afternoon, if not maybe perhaps on Monday morning, preparing all week long so that when the crowd is gathered, there's a meal that can be served. I think of choir members who come to choir practice, not just because they love music, although they do, but because they love the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I think of sound technicians working with sound checks and making sure batteries are in microphones. I think about the video technicians who put all the words into the computer. I think about Awana workers that show up early. I think about anybody that gets off work and rushes to get here. I think about the preparation that's required. If you've got children in the house, just getting them up and getting all of them alive to church and getting here with the same number you left the house with. The challenge for many of our churches today is the same challenge as Jesus described in Matthew chapter 9, namely that the farmhouse is full but the field is empty. The dining room chairs are full but the kitchen is empty. Empty. The consumers are plentiful, but the preparers are few. Martha was willing to work. There's the labor that was required. Notice also the loss that was revealed. The Bible says in verse 2, they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving. But Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Get the scene in your mind. Everyone's in the dining room enjoying time with Jesus, and Martha is in The kitchen, but pay very close attention. She's enjoying others enjoying Jesus. She's willing to be behind the scenes out of the onlooking eye of the crowd because others are enjoying Jesus. Did you you know that while we're in here enjoying this worship service, there is a host of Faithful nursery workers right across the hall making sure that our service is free from unnecessary distraction. Do you think they woke up this morning and said, Praise God, it's my turn to change dirty diapers. (laughs) Do you think they woke up this morning and said, Oh, I hope one of them spits up on me. But no, they and some of you who take your regular turn there in the nursery... You do it and you do it with joy. It's not that getting spit up on is joyful. It's not that changing dirty diapers is joyful. It's the joy that knowing what I'm doing is letting other people encounter the Jesus that I know. She's willing to suffer loss. She's willing to have her preferences not met. Maybe she's a little bit like the person who's in a service listening to a song that's not their favorite, but they say, my itch doesn't have to be scratched with every song. He looks like he's getting blessed, and I'll just enjoy him enjoying Jesus. What changed between this occasion and the previous occasion when Jesus had to rebuke Martha? I'll tell you what changed. Martha changed. R. Kent Hughes writes about this change and says she had learned, listen, that service can be worship if done with the right attitude. You may not know this, but last week while you were enjoying morning worship and we were enjoying evening worship last week, did did you know that the baptistry still had a little bit of a leak in it? It's It's been fixed now, but last Sunday we baptized in all the services and because of the leak from the from the drain on the baptistry, There were men, while you were in here enjoying the music, I heard that the choir brought you to your feet last Sunday morning. There were men faithfully toting out five-gallon buckets full of water. And when work like that is done for the glory of Jesus, it's as much an act of worship as a choir that can bring you to your feet and pull a shout out of your mouth. The loss that was revealed. There's the labor that was required and then there's the love that was released. What's motivating Martha to do this? I believe it's a love for Jesus. Mary would come in a moment and bring her love in an alabaster box. Martha serves her love on a plate. Just a few days earlier, her brother Lazarus was sick. Jesus came and raised Lazarus from the dead And now, listen, now there is no task too great, there is no service too demanding, no sacrifice that is too high for Martha to serve Jesus. I heard about a missionary that was a doctor, a medical missionary. And he performed some work for this man and in the process led that native African to the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Several days later, there was a knock on the door of the medical mission. And it was the man who had been won to Christ. It caught the doctor by surprise because he knew that that African native lived four days' journey away. The man was there with a basket of fruit and said, I raised this fruit, I grew this fruit, and I wanted to bring it to you. And the doctor said, you mean you, you walked four days this way and four days back just to bring me some fruit? And the native said, long walk, part of gift. The meal that was made. One last thing as we notice in verse 3, the gift that was given. No doubt this is the central action of this supper time worship service because right in the middle of the gathering, here comes Mary to bring a gift that was surprising to all, even scandalous to some. I want you to consider three things about this gift as we conclude this morning. First, how expensive it was. The Bible says in verse 3, Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume, a pure nard. Judas would later say that it could have been sold for 300 denarii. I won't bother you with all of the conversion to modern money, but it's about a year's salary. You recently turned in your uh, yearly income taxes, so figure your yearly income. Get that number in your mind. That's what Mary lavished on Jesus Christ. We'll see in our next lesson how Judas complained. And by the way, Whenever people begin to spend money on the work of God, there will always be somebody standing off in the shadows, off in the wings, griping about how much money has been spent, wanting to call a meeting of the finance committee to get to the bottom of all the waste. One of the things you'll find about Judas is what really ticked him off is that it wasn't about him. But notice how expensive it was. Secondly, notice how expressive it was. The scripture says in verse 3 that she came and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. Her gift was conspicuous, public, and even daring. Women in that culture did not let down their hair. It was viewed as immodest and inappropriate. The hair was viewed to be the glory of the woman, and women did not just unveil that type of glory out in public but here comes Mary and she takes whatever glory she had and along with the perfume she consumes it all on Jesus and listen to me friend she doesn't care what anybody else thinks she doesn't care what anybody else says she doesn't care what anybody else sees she's going to pour her worship on Jesus I know that everybody in the building this morning is not a happy clappy Singer or shouter like your pastor can very frequently be. But some of us, we're stayed and reserved in worship because we're afraid of what everybody else is going to think. We're afraid that somebody else might see. Well, here we find a woman that she's not concerned about the opinion of anybody else. I I reason in my mind that she may have been in another room. And heard the laughter and heard the talking. And then she recognized it was the familiar voice of Lazarus, her brother that Jesus had raised from the dead. And he had changed the fevered brow and the dead body into one that was full of life. And Mary says, I can't wait any longer. I've got to pour my love on the Lord Jesus. Now, I know some of you are not that expressive, but every once in a while, I, I, I see folks that I think, you couldn't, get a, you, couldn't get a, you couldn't get a grunt out of them if you stuck them in the britches with a corsage pin. You say, well, I don't like to shout. I don't like to say amen. Could you look like you don't need a glass of prune juice? You old timers explain that to the kids on the way home. How expensive it was, how expressive it was. Notice finally how extensive it was. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. When you pour your worship on Jesus, you have no idea how far it's going to go. In Matthew 26, verses 12 and 13, 
Jesus on this same occasion said, When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of, <coughs> pardon me, spoken of in memory of her. This final act of worship was so great that Jesus said, wherever they tell my story, they're going to tell Mary's story. And wherever they tell Mary's story, they're going to tell my story as well. Now sit very still, don't move around, don't put up your stuff, but listen very carefully. Listen attentively. I started with John chapter 20, verse 31, where John said, I wrote this thing down so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you might have life in His name. My question as I close this morning, what is it about your life of worship in this service, before this service, after this service, what is it about your life of worship that would ever cause the Holy Spirit to say, write that down and tell the world? Because if an onlooking world could ever see the worship that that person has poured out on Jesus, it will give them a reason to know Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And believing that truth, they could have eternal life in His name. What about your worship? In all of its forms, in all of its places, in all of its time frames, what about our worship would cause people to believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? Friend, when that happens, we can know we have given to our Savior extravagant worship. Let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you for the truth of this text. And I pray that this message, all of our singing, the prayers, the fellowshipping, and all the preparation that, that it took to host this worship service would be pleasing in your sight and honoring to your holy son Jesus, in whose glorious name we pray. Amen.